Welcome to Animal Rights, the Abolitionist Approach Commentary. I'm Gary Francione. This is our 14th No Frills, No Bells, No Whistles commentary concerning the abolition of animal exploitation, the failure of animal welfare regulation, veganism as the moral baseline of the animal rights movement, and the importance of the principle of ahimsa or nonviolence in all of our advocacy efforts. Well, this week we have... Uh, back both uh, Dr. Roger Yates and New Zealand podcasting phenomenon Elizabeth Collins to have a um, have an analysis of the second segment of the BBC program Animals and Us. Uh, for those of you who may not have uh, have heard either the program or the previous podcast, uh, BBC World Service, which is the most widely listened to radio program uh, on, uh, on the planet, uh, has a has a series called One Planet, and they did a two part segment called Animals and Us that was um, hosted by Victor Schoenfeld. Now, Victor Schoenfeld in 1982 did the highly influential The Animals film, which was narrated by Julie Christie, and uh, it had a profound impact on many of us who were around back then, and and the people who have seen it since. It, but 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 for those of us who were involved in this in 1982, it was the first time that we really saw any film about the way humans treated animals and it was a shocking film and a disturbing film and it was a film that provoked a lot of uh, a lot of uh, discussion back then and uh, and in many ways I think helped um, uh, form and shape the emerging social movement unfortunately the emerging social movement fell off the cliff and just became a welfare movement again but in any event uh, the film was important in terms of uh, of, of getting getting the steam uh, getting the steam going in the early 1980s. So today, Roger Yates, uh, who, like me, was around back then, and Elizabeth Collins, who, unlike Roger and me, was not around back then, uh, will be discussing the second segment. Welcome, Roger. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hello. How Hello. are you doing? Now, we are on, uh, and I apologize for any any uh, sound issues, um, we are we're doing this on Skype and uh and I'm uh, in the United States obviously and Roger is in Ireland and uh Elizabeth is in New Zealand so we're doing this on a Skype uh, a Skype uh, connection and um, sometimes these things don't work perfectly but we uh, we obviously endeavor to do our best and Elizabeth is a uh, a wonderful sound engineer she is a sound sound en- engineer <laughs> and uh, and she and she she she, she does uh, she cleans it up but obviously there may be some uh, some distor- distortions and uh, certainly no distortions in substance but there may be some distortions in uh, technology so, in any event, well, what did you all think of the second segment of uh, of uh, Victor Schoenfeld's Animals and Us? I was much happier with it than the first one. <laughs> but, but in terms of his analysis or his, his coverage of vivisection, what did you think? Um, well, I just want to say as somebody who is very new to all this um, and really knew nothing about vivisection because... Um, I just haven't done the research on that. Uh, it, there were some astonishing revelations to me, and I know for a fact that there are people out there who listening who've never thought about the issue. Um, you know, a lot of people are against vivisection who still eat animals, as we know. The revelations of the 90% failure rate and then of the 10%, 5% of the um, testing um, of the drugs just having to be recalled, that, that was an astonishing um, figure for me. And I really do hope that um, a lot of people were listening to that. And, re- and the best part was when the guy said it was all about the money. That was the best part of the whole vivisection thing. It was all about the money and universities are businesses too. You know, I thought that was, uh, when he had Low Levin from Yale, basically saying this is all about business and then when the issue came up about academic research and he said hey you know universities are businesses too now i've been working in one for 26 years and um and uh, that is so incredibly true the idea that um, universities are some sort of uh, pristine generators of uh, truth with a capital t and that they don't really have any uh, vested interest is so such nonsense. Uh, universities are businesses. They're corporations. They run, you know, they're businesses. And then I thought Levin made that point wonderfully. And I think as a general matter, I, I thought Victor uh, succeeded uh, beautifully in exposing 
animal research as ineffective, counterproductive, a waste of time. And he also raised an issue that I have very rarely seen uh, or, uh, or heard discussed, and that is the politics of animal research. The fact that uh, there are various ways of, a, of attacking a social problem. This is something I actually I've written about in, in Introduction to Animal Rights and other things that I, I, I've written, that there are different ways of, of attacking a social problem. Uh, for example, you have you have a situation like HIV and AIDS, and there are different ways of dealing with with a, a social problem like that. You can you can put money into safe sex education and needle distribution and condom distribution and and things like that, and you can radically dramatically reduce the number of new HIV cases. Or you can take lots of money and put it into uh, animal research, uh, and animal research has has basically done nothing to, to uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the in vivo research that they've done uh, in animals hasn't really done very much to teach us anything about uh, HIV or AIDS, but putting that aside, we can either put the money into animal research or we can put the money into programs that actually do work in terms of reducing new cases of AIDS and and but 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 needle distribution and condom distribution and particularly in, in the United States talking about safe sex these are political solutions which are not acceptable and so we pretend as though the solution to the problem is 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 uh, uh, animal research and I thought it was wonderful that Victor introduced this idea uh, yesterday uh, through low Levin and I think some of the other comments that look you want to you want to deal with diseases. Give people better nutrition. Give them better education. Give them better transportation. When the when when life quality increases, disease goes down. And that there are different ways of of, of attacking a problem. And and uh, you know putting uh, you know zillions of dollars into cancer research is not getting us very far because cancer is going up. Roger, what, yes. what, what, what was I mean you you know what was you 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 have a perspective on this because like me you've been around since the the early eighties and. and Actually, the late seventies. So, so what was your sense of? Uh, indeed, of it? indeed. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I think um, in in one sense there was, no, there was nothing new. There was there was a lot of uh, scientific anti-vivisection arguments. Um, there was the usual thing about the vivisection industry, as it were, dragging their feet, which was quite interesting. Also, you talked about uh, universities and talked about it in the program about universities being a business. Of course, vivisection itself is a a business, and one aspect which I thought was very relevant to your perspective, Gary, was when Michael Balls from Frame was talking about the domino effect. Do you remember that bit about the yes, domino effect? Yes, 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 um, yes. Yeah, that's right. And so he, he was talking about how uh, even the smallest move from the vivisectors was resisted because they thought that if they gave in, as it were, to the anti-vivisectionists being seen to be pushed around, then that would kind of be the thin end of the wedge and, as he called it, the domino effect and that the, therefore that the entire thing would be critiqued you know in, in other words if if something was being focused on like the dre's test or a particular toxicology test and um the vivisector said yes well this isn't working and so on so on, there's a problem here that 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 itself was a problem because the anti-vivisector then would claim a victory um you know and so that goes back to to this entire issue which you've discussed in a wider context about why the resistance even um, in terms of things that they kind of agree with. Well, you know, you know, it's it's also interesting because I agree with your observation, Roger, and I think I think Victor. I, actually, I, I I actually think this segment was really subtle in a lot of ways in terms of the the um, the, the various little strands that Victor sort of picked up and brought together. Uh, I I thought it was. Um, quite clever but um yeah so absolutely no no good for elizabeth generation then really <laughs> yes that's right i mean um because one of, one of the things one of the ideas that he brought out was the idea that um vivisectors are resistant in large part because they have they feel um i mean unlike the unlike people in the meat industry you know the the people who are selling uh, you know, beef will sell bananas if they can make more money selling bananas. Uh, they're indifferent. They're, they don't have a, a, a moral stake in the situation. 
whereas uh, the vivisectors do. The vivisectors have a moral stake in the situation. So in a sense, they're resisting not only because of, um, you know, that they fear that their economic enterprise will be jeopardized, although I have no doubt that there's a that there's an element of that in there because it is a business. Um, it's the way they do things. They've got an economic stake in it. They know how to do it. They know how to get grants to do it. Uh, there's a real formula for it. Um, and, and so they, they do have an economic stake in it for sure. But they also have a moral stake in it in that um, they, you know, people who do vivisection, they're generally educated people. They're generally people, the ones I've known, actually do wrestle with the moral issues. And I've known, I mean, you know, I've been teaching in a university for 25, 26 years. Now, I know a fair number of vivisectors. Some of them are um, morally oblivious, but many of them are not. And many of them are people who really do wrestle with this issue. And I think part of the resistance is that... Um, if they acknowledge that there is any problem with vivisection, uh, that starts uh, that starts creating a moral problem for them because then things that they've done that are very unpleasant and things that they know are horribly harmful to animals and result in hideous pain to animals, and they all do. I mean, I've never met. I mean, vivisectors when they talk to you privately, uh, you know, they acknowledge that uh, there are all sorts of problems and that animals suffer in all sorts of ways, both physically and psychologically, um, and that you know that it's a really messy, nasty, horrible business. And um, but they believe, you know, they believe that. Um, uh, what they're doing is necessary and is it redounds to the benefit of humankind. So as a result, they really do have a, a, a sort of a, a, of, a, of a moral stake here. If it turns out that they were wrong and there were other ways of doing things and what they were doing was, quote, unnecessary, unquote, that raises moral problems for a lot of them. And I thought, you know, that, that, that idea got out, got out uh, in the segment. I thought, I thought that was intriguing. It was. I mean, if it's openly known that 90 percent, Fails and that five percent of the ten percent that works gets recalled. They must know this themselves. How can they justify it to themselves? It's just—is it another form of incredible self-delusion? There's also the point, the unkind point, really, that um, uh, Hans Reusch made uh, in in uh, 1979. In fact, uh, interestingly, um, Slaughtered Innocent, which is the uh, Hans Reusch's famous book, it was the first animal rights book I ever read, or at least I thought it was an animal rights book until I realized that it was in the scientific intersection book and, and Roche himself was an opponent of animal rights. But um, he said there that um, anyone can cut up guinea pigs and report on the results, whereas, you, you know, a, a uh, training in some of the alternatives, so-called, m- might, might take, might take a, a, bit, a bit more kind of brain power, which I think is probably, you know, a very... Um, unkind way of, of putting it but that's also an element to it in the sense that you touched on the notion that there is a kind of industry here and uh, we've got uh, organizations such as charles river for example and i think it's st- still the case that they they own islands where they breed primates for research right um you know and um i, I started a campaign in the 1980s against hazelton which is now called Colvins. uh, uh the the british uh, branch of that is still in harrogate in yorkshire and um they were a massive uh, business in its own right, you know, in the sense that they they did toxicology research, they did uh, some elements of pure research, so-called, but also they did a lot of breeding, um, you know, and it was a worldwide, it was a multi multi million pound multinational industry. So there is that element to it that we, you know, we are talking about something that is well established, and um, the funding, as you suggested, Gary, is. Um, is vivisectors funding other vivisectors in that in that sense? It's all peer reviewed, and so there's a real resistance to change. I, I think in, in that sense, and I think that's probably one of the things that have taken perhaps the um, alternative people, you know, like the Frames and the um, the Hadwin Trust and the Lord Dowding Trust, etc., taking them by surprise in in a sense because the scientific case against vivisection is often made, and yet they still find resistance. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I think I think uh, part of it is that you know you have basic research and you have applied research, and um, you know I was uh, I was glad that Victor got into the segment the 
huge portion, the 90% or whatever, that's basically useless. But you, you see, you would have a lot of research people disagreeing with that because they would say a lot of animal research is basic research and we don't really know where it's going to lead. And, you know, we're doing this experiment and that experiment. We don't know yeah. what, you know, what, what, the, what great benefit is going to result, you know, going to come, come as a result of this. And so, um, you know, it, it's, a. Uh, it, it's difficult. I mean, I I, I would imagine that um, most vivisectors who listen to that program uh, w- would disagree with the percentage of of uh, use. I mean, I think they're all useless, but I mean, you know, th- they would disagree and say, well, no, that's not true, and you can't even say that because you don't know where a lot of animal research is heading. The the one thing though, I think is it's it's, it's important. I mean, look. Animal use and experiments is in certain ways different. I mean, in, in Introduction to Animal Rights, I basically say that 99.9% of, of, our, of our use of animals, you don't even need really a complicated theory of animal rights to, to see that it's problematic if you agree with the principle that it's wrong to inflict unnecessary pain, suffering, and death on animals. 90, you know, 99.99999% of our use of animals can only be described as unnecessary in that it's, it's for the purposes of amusement. Uh, convenience or uh, or pleasure, and and that the only use of animals that we we make that is not transparently frivolous. I don't agree with any of it, and let me make that clear. Uh, for those of you who like to misquote me or misrepresent what I'm saying, I want to make it clear. I am opposed to all animal experimentation. Uh, I don't care what it is, how it is, how it's done, or what benefits it may or may not give. I don't really care. It's all unjustified. However, I do think it's the one use of animals that we make that's not transparent apparently frivolous. And I think it's a bit more complicated in that I've, I've always found it sort of interesting as a historical matter that if you go back to the 19th century in Britain, uh, you, you see that the, 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 the real focus, uh, the primary focus of the animal movement in the 19th century is, is on vivisection. And vivisection is the only use of animals that we make where there's a plausible claim that we're getting some real benefit where there's some there, there's a plausible claim of nece- of empirical necessity that if you don't do it you don't get the data now i think that's wrong as an empirical matter uh but i think that that but the, but at least it's not transparently frivolous that's not a transparently frivolous claim it requires greater examination and analysis. You can't just brush it off the way you can with meat eating or sport hunting or the use of animals and entertainment and stuff like that, which is just ridiculous, nonsense, transparently frivolous. Um, And I've always found it interesting that the animal movement, because certainly when I got involved in the animal movement in I guess, you know, I mean, I, I, I didn't formally get involved with it in, in uh, until the early 80s, but I was, you know, aware of it because I'd become a vegetarian in the late 70s. And so I was aware of what was going on, and everything seemed to be focusing on vivisection, which is really interesting when you think about it, because it's the one activity that most of us don't do. Um, as a matter of fact, you know, uh, uh, very, very few people in the grand scheme of things do vivisection. Most people don't even know vivisector, of, you know, that they don't, they, they've never even met a vivisector. Um, and uh, it's a very, very sort of abstract thing. It's something that, you know, you could in the 19th century go and, you know, have a big demonstration, um, you know, outside of, you know, uh, uh, a hospital that's doing vivisection, and you could get all the progressives together and have a demonstration against vivisection and then everybody could repair it to their homes and eat their you know steak and kidney pies and 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 whatnot um and and other animal products so it's not so in a sense i i find it sort of curious that the movement both in the united states and in britain in the 19th and in a large part of the 20th century i mean if you think about the 1980s roger i mean most of what we were talking about back then was experimentation was it not well, I think there's obviously um, there's a strong uh, anthropogenic section history in uh, England. Uh, that's true. But then again, I think it really depends on if you like what part of the movement you're involved in. For example, I've always been really been involved in what's called the grassroots, and so in in that sense, um, I think uh, hunt saboteur, uh, and sabotage was a big issue there and uh, it was a a weekly if not uh, twice weekly even three times a week activity the circus demos and fur uh, was another one um often often what was going on in those days was um the notion of looking for the doable and the winnable 
And so that directed a lot, a lot of things. That directed um, campaigns against fur, for example. It uh, directed uh, campaigns against sports, which everybody thought this is going to be the first thing to go. And it also directed uh, campaigns against uh, circuses, not so much zoos, but circuses. Um, so I think there was that that kind of search for the winnable uh, going on. At the same time in England, as I said um, the last time I think we spoke, uh, there was this... Um, this big radicalization which uh, accrued from the taking over of the BYV, the British Union for the Abolition of Vivisection. And I think uh, for my generation, that's one of the reasons why vivisection became a big issue. In fact, um, it's interesting in a way because some of the people who took over the BYV soon realized within a few months that their remit was a little bit too uh, limited for what they wanted to do. And so they started to move out. In fact, um, it was people from the BOV that set up uh, alongside uh, myself and a couple of other people, the Fur Action Group, for example, because they, they wanted to get beyond vivisection. But in terms of the mainstream movement, yeah, I think there was a, a, a strong push uh, about vivisection. Animal Aid, I think, uh, which began in 1977, they focused, first of all, on vivisection. Um, compassion World Farming was very small uh, at the time, so they, they were always seen that as a kind of small partner of of the movement, even if um, if they were included in the animal rights movement, so-called, they were seen as, as, a, as a kind of more peripheral thing because people were focused on, uh, it was not like, again, the domino effect, you know, what, what would be the first to go? And so people thought, right, blood sports, um, fur, circuses. And I think then because of this radicalization of the BOV, vivisection uh, was a big, strong thing then as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, it's certainly in the, in the United States, um, uh, if you look in the 1980s, I mean, the main cases were the Taub case, that was vivisection, the Generelli case at the University of Pennsylvania, that was vivisection, SEMA case, that was vivisection. Um, I mean, there was a real, there were other, yeah, you're right, Roger, there were, there were other, other campaigns and issues as well. The anti-fur thing has always been um, kicking around here. Uh, it has been for, for decades, hasn't gotten anywhere, and I think it raises its own issues about uh, sexism. But, but, uh, but yeah, you know, I, I agree with you that there, that there were other things going on, but that the, the, the sort of the, the mainstream dominant, the, 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 the mainstream uh, uh, movement was focused on the use of animals in experiments. Mm. Well, I'd, I'd agree that. Obviously, there was the Canadian thing with the seals as well, which was a big thing in, in, in Britain, uh, although the geographical separation from that, which is, which is probably one reason. In fact, uh, for, interestingly, some, some of the, uh, the big groups in Ireland, they focus on um, things like kangaroo slaughter in, in Australia and uh, the seal killing in, in uh, Canada as uh, a good means of um, trying to encourage Irish people to support them in the sense that they're, they're supporting the, a, a no real threat to their own uh, daily practices, which is quite interesting. We do the same thing here with, uh, with the Koreans and the Chinese people eating dogs. Yeah, that's right. You know, yeah. It's and the, the same and thing. the Japanese with right. ailing, of course. Exactly, yeah, right. exactly, exactly. <laughs> I think uh, I think Elizabeth came up with um, an, an interesting thing about vivisection, though, in the sense that um, it, it taps into this um, division between the notion of treatment and use, I think, in the sense that uh, of all the different uses, um, I think that vivisection can be seen as torture. I think that's what Elizabeth, uh, a point that Elizabeth made either in a podcast or when, when we were just talking. Is that is that right, Elizabeth? Yeah, I was um, part of the general public who was um, eating animals and was horrified by vivisection. And um, and also with the first thing, it's a really good point that you mentioned about how we're, we're fighting these things that we don't directly do. Like, oh, I can protest that doesn't actually, I don't, you know, I'm not going to be, I'm not responsible for that, so I can condemn that as immoral. And it doesn't mean that I have to look to my right and to my left and find that my entire community is doing that. When you think about fur, only very wealthy people can really afford it, except for nowadays when, you you know, it's getting cheaper and you can buy the fur trim and things. But if you really think about it, that's sort of like the rich elite of the world who wear fur. So like, you know, the working class and, and everybody like that can sort of like boo and hiss at them. Um, and also with the section as well, people need to be educated because they don't realize that, I mean, if you start with diet, the one of the best things about the broadcast is, this, is the fact that this guy said, look, you know, environment, diet, health, I mean, w we need to be 
um, taking better care of ourselves and then um, you know, people don't actually realize that they're responsible for vivisection. To them, it's just a ludicrous suggestion. They think that it's all happening um, at this sort of elite level and um, that they really have nothing to do with it. They don't really realize the demand that they make for these happy pills and things like that. So um, as a person who used to, um, you know, eat, eat everything and wear everything, I thought that... Um, you know, vivisection was, um, you had to be a sadist and there was this sort of mindset that, that it's, it's occurring and we don't want it to occur. You know, it's got nothing to do with us. Why is this happening? You know, and we don't realize that it's also related to our consumption. It's just, it's just further removed. So um, when, you, when, when I used to think about, I mean, I was very anti-vivisection my whole entire life. My whole life, from the moment I first found out about it, and I don't know how old I was, um, it absolutely horrified me, and I was so against it. And, um, and this was before I even thought about the animals that I was eating or anything like that. It's like this kind of, you almost think of it when you're just a, when you're a, when you're a person who's not even thinking about the issue. It's this far removed kind of Frankenstein kind of um, torture chamber kind of image, and you feel like it's like happening outside of society, and 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 um, it's got absolutely nothing to do with with um, with anything that you're doing as an individual. It's almost like this almost like another elite thing like the fur issue and it's it's, um it's just horrifying to people because they really do think of that as unnecessary gary it's ironic it's very ironic people think that they have to eat animals but you know it's just really strange but that's why the importance of education is just so crucial no i agree with you that the connection between you know what most of the diseases that they're doing research on to try to find cures for being caused by our eating animal products but but you know there was a there was an article uh in in the times online yesterday uh and um uh that talked about the the increase uh, in Britain of the number of animals used because the number of animals used is going up pretty dramatically, and um, I mean for all of the uh, for for all of the efforts of the uh, the animal people, it hasn't really had much of an effect in terms of the number of animals is going up, and it was a it was a disturbing article for me at least in a number of respects because. Um, it uh, there there were attempts made to uh, I thought I, I I thought rather rather. Uh, uh, it's interesting how in journalism, you know, whenever journalists are talking about the animal issue, they want to be scrupulously, quote, objective, uh, end quote, which basically means they want to be critical of the animal perspective. But when they're talking about um, uh, institutional exploitation, they oftentimes don't realize how much they propagandize when they write their articles. But in, in any event, um, one of the points that was made in this article was that, um, you know, we, again, we like to think about vivisection as something they do. And uh, but vivisection is something we tolerate. Uh, it is something we demand. I mean, I mean, and, and it shouldn't come as any surprise to us because most of us eat animals, and there's no necessity for that whatsoever. And we know there's no necessity. I mean, most of us who you know, I mean, really, I mean, mo- most people really do know. Uh, I mean, they 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 they. they Certainly, we've got to do a better job educating. But you know, I, I, I mean, a lot of people are aware of the fact that it's not necessary for them to eat animal products. Um, and and uh, whereas many people believe that vivisection is necessary, the, the vivisection industry, uh, both the commercial industry and the university industry, which are very very closely tied, they've done a very very good job of convincing people that this is a, that this is something that they really need for their health. So I don't understand why anybody thinks that the public, which is tolerating massive amounts of animal exploitation, killing 56 billion animals a year annually for reasons of pleasure, amusement, or convenience, is all of a sudden going to rise up and demand the end of the vivisection industry. But the point is, we tolerate it. I mean, they do it. They do it because we want them to do it. Again, it, it, it brings us back to the issue that if we ever want anything to change, it's got to come about as a result of educating people and shifting the paradigm that focusing on the institutional users you can you can close down Huntington life sciences it doesn't matter if the if if people want vivisection to continue which they clearly do then either Huntington will rebuild or or the the supply will come from expanded uh, other suppliers or whatever so I mean it's it's Campaigns like this are, are, are rather useless, uh, particularly when seen in isolation. One point I wanted to make, you know, when Roger was saying, well, in the 1980s, you know, there was a focus on vivisection, but that there were also uh, uh, there was also a focus on other campaigns as well. 
but, but you know, Roger, the thinking was really very different back then because because the the single issue campaigns that were being mounted back then weren't being portrayed as sort of particular examples, or at least not not ubiquitously being presented as particular examples of things that were bad that needed to end, but rather as you know part of part of the progression towards the abolition of, 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 ex, of exploitation, that these were the things we were going after. But there were a lot of people in the movement back then who were quite willing to say and openly said, you know, we think that there should be no exploitation. We're just going after these things. And, and to the extent that there are single issue campaigns now, they are, um, they're not being portrayed in that way. They're being portrayed as this is something which is particularly insidious and it really ought to go. And then the thinking person looks at it and says, well, gee, you know, it's really no different from a lot of other things. So why should we focus arbitrarily on this rather than on something else. But um, in any event, I had a couple other comments that I wanted to, to raise with you all, and that was um, I thought uh, Victor did a really great job with the guy from uh, from NIH when, uh, I think his name was Stokes, when he interviewed Stokes, and Stokes is supposed to be responsible for finding alternatives to, to animals uh, in the U.S., and um, and and when Victor asked him, well, how many animals are you using? And Stokes had to confess the 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 unspoken uh, American embarrassment, which is, um, although we have something called the Federal Animal Welfare Act, which is supposed to protect the animals used in experimentation, um, the Federal Animal Welfare Act excludes rats, rats, mice, and uh, and other animals as animals, and basically says they're not animals for purposes of the Animal Welfare Act. So 90% rats and mice are 90% of the animals used in vivisection, and um, in the United States at least, and 90% of the animals that are used are not counted basically because they're not considered to be animals under United States law. And um, and this is this is a, 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 a it's interesting because originally. Rats and mice were not explicitly excluded in the statute in the Animal Welfare Act. It was left to the Secretary of Health and Human Services to um, to to uh, uh, determine, um, uh, uh, or the Secretary of Agriculture, I forget which what, one one of the uh, one of the various secretaries was supposed to determine uh, uh, what an animal was for purposes of coverage of the Animal Welfare Act, and by administrative regulation, uh, rats and mice and birds were excluded. Um, and and the animal people for one of, one of the great campaigns in the United States has been for years and years and years. They've been trying to get rats and mice covered under the Animal Welfare Act, and then finally uh, they reached some sort of accommodation uh, with the government that rats and mice were going to be covered. And Congress turned around and pulled the rug out from under the agreement and basically changed the statute and said that uh, rats and mice are not covered by the Animal Welfare Act. And I thought that Victor did a great job getting Stokes to acknowledge that basically um, he doesn't know what's going on, that he's the guy in charge, but he doesn't really know. And I thought Victor's analogy of saying, well, you know, isn't that like saying the Department of Defense doesn't know how many soldiers it has? And and uh, and, and Stokes didn't really have, have, a, have a, a response. Um, uh, my, uh, uh, Roger mentioned Michael Balls. Michael Balls at the University of Nottingham, who runs something called the Fund for the Replacement of Animals and Medical Experiments. Michael Balls was quoted in uh, Victor's segment as um, as saying that in another ten or fifteen years, it would be possible if we really wanted to, we could have repla- We could, you know, we could have. Um, uh, 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 alternatives, uh, non-animal alternatives for all animal experiments. We wouldn't have to use any animals in experiments if we really wanted to, if we if we had the will to do that. I remember in 1984, Roger, meeting with Michael Balls in Nottingham, England, um, and uh, we were talking then about the emerging anti-vivisection movement, both in Britain and in, in the United States. And Balls was very concerned about this because he thought that um, this was going to make things uh, confrontational, and it was going to uh, it was going to so- sort of increase the adversarial tone of the of the discussion. But Michael Balls told me in 1984 that um, in 25 years. Uh, technology would be at the point where nobody would be using animals. Well, now it's 25 years later, and now Michael Balls is saying another 10 or 15 years we'll be able to get rid of them. But it just goes to show, you know, it's the same old song. You know, it's uh, as Sonny and Cher said, the beat goes on, the beat goes on. Yeah, that's right. And of course, but th- uh, they did also say that uh, there, are some, there are some procedures now that we can do on uh, human volunteers that, that weren't possible before. So 
uh, from their own perspective, things are moving, but very slowly. And I suppose um, they'd have various uh, re reasons uh, for that, I, I guess, uh, in, in terms of trying to explain, uh, you know, what was going on. Sure. I mean, but there, sure, there are, there's computer modeling, there's mathematical modeling, there's the use of, 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 of humans um, who, who stand to benefit from these sorts of tests and things like that. Um, I mean, there's always a problem with informed consent, but, you know, there are, there are alternatives. But the bottom line is the number of animals that we're using is increasing. It's not decreasing. Yeah, I think uh, one interesting thing there is that when he, when he says we in that uh, uh, sentence, you know, who, who are you talking about? I, mean, I get the impression that he's talking about the scientific community rather than society. Do, do you think that's right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You mean you're talking about when Michael Ball says we? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I do. Well, he's, he is, I mean, he's part of the scientific community. He sees himself as working from the inside. And, um, and I think that, um, uh, you know, if, if he thinks the past 25 years has been anything indicative of success, then I, I would uh, respectfully disagree with him because I think he's wrong. But the end, you know, the, the end, what I really loved about the, the, uh, the second segment was at the end, uh, it seems as though Victor sort of comes around to, to seeing that, um, oh, oh, he, he did mention, I wanted to say before we get to this, he did again in this segment, as he did in the first segment, seem to distinguish, and I, again, I do not know why, he seemed to distinguish the Austrian situation from the rest of the world. And he suggested that what Martin Ballack and, and company is doing in Austria is, is um, somehow uh, different from what's going on elsewhere. And again, as I said last week, I will repeat again, I think, uh, with all respect, Victor, you're wrong on that. I think that what's going on in Austria is really no different from what's going on any place else. Um, and, and for example, uh, uh, he talked about the the ban on battery cages in in uh, in Austria. Um, in Rain Without Thunder, uh, I, I would describe that. I mean, I, I talked about prohibitions for, as opposed to regulations, but they had to be prohibitions of significant constituent activities that were based on inherent value and blah blah blah. And I gave a bunch of conjunctive conditions. Um, that if, anim if, if animal advocates, I, I advised against animal advocates pursuing these campaigns in favor of their doing nonviolent, creative, vegan uh, education. But I said if they wanted to pursue these regulations campaigns, then they at least ought to be prohibitions and they ought to be significant prohibitions. And one of the points that I pointed out, one of the, one of the points that I made was that anything could be construed or characterized as a as a prohibition so if you have a battery cage that you know gives uh, each you know that, that that's 100 and, you know 50 square inches or whatever and you you require that the cage be 151 square inches then what you've done is you've prohibited the cage that's 150 square inches so anything can be described as a prohibition so to to call what's happened in austria with respect to battery cages as a prohibition, I think is really problematic because what it's doing is it's, pre it, it, it's saying you can't have battery cages, but you can have these cage-free torture devices. And that's not really a prohibition at all. To me, that is no different from you know, the conventional battery cage and cage-free eggs. The only difference is the size of the cage. Um, and and um, you know that th that is that is the, the 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 primary difference and and so I think I, I I disagree with Victor and how he was using the concept of prohibition there. I also think it's important to, to understand that um, to the extent that they've gotten rid of of um, uh, that Austria has banned the use of uh, great apes in experiments. Again, I don't I don't know that we can uh, read too terribly much into that. First of all, I don't know how much was going on in Austria before that ban. Number one, number two, there are places now where that's being done, and it's very expensive. It's, uh, uh, using apes uh, uh, is very very expensive, um, and so it probably makes economic sense to have have ape research done in centralized locations. And again, I don't know how much was being done in 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 Austria. As far as the ban on fur farms is concerned, the sale of fur coats hasn't gone down in Austria. So so again, 
you know you can get rid of the fur farms in Austria, but so what? Um, you, you know, if the if the if the demand is there, then the fur products are simply bought from places like Taiwan or Korea or places where you know uh, I, I don't have much I, I don't I don't place much stock in any welfare regulations. But I'm certainly not going to think that the welfare regulations uh, any place else are any better. So I mean, what difference does it make? You get it out of your backyard, you put it into someone else's backyard, you pat yourself on the back and say we're being moral while we're still consuming the same number of fur coats. So I think that that was that, that was the only criticism I had of the of the segment was that again he goes back to this idea that what's going on in Austria is different and I I don't think it is. Yeah, it was it was a it was a puzzle for me as well to be honest um, Gary because he did it twice in the sentence in the first show and also in the second um, section as as you say. And um it it was quite interesting to me what why um he would he would do that. Um, at first, I thought it might be something to do with the fact that uh, the DVD version of the Animals film um, has got a new ending now that the director's cut, and, and he kind of um, mentions the Austrian and Switzerland uh, situation there. So I thought it might be something to do with that, um, because I, I, I thought it didn't really fit with the rest of the, uh, the critique. Um, and I think that's why, in a sense, that there was some ambiguity about what he was saying. He seemed to be praising... The, the Balak approach, and then he seemed to be criticizing at the end, and he did that twice. He, he did it first in the first program, as, as, as we spoke about before. And in this one, he was talking about this movement from great apes to apes, and then I, I don't know what, but he was talking talking in terms of um, really kind of creaking slowness of, of, of these campaigns. And he said that, um, that Balak's victory um, had a high cost to Balak itself at high personal cost on the grounds that the state, as it were, have reacted to what was going on and, and now uh, Balak is waiting uh, on remand or on on, um, on bail uh, for some charges in relation to their, their activities. And he says that uh, this cost may well close down further uh, animal advocacy in, in the country in the sense that it, it would stop people being willing to be animal ad- advocates. But at the same time, he didn't go on to say that, well, you know, this strategy may close down animal advocacy also, just on a kind of theoretical uh, matter, and in the sense that the, the strategy is falling into that trap of, of making people think, well, we've got rid of the worst successes, so everything's okay now. Um, and, um, and so that forced shuffle in the end, I thought, he said, right at the end, he said, but, you know, is the Austrian tactic enough? He still had that nagging doubt. He was kind of bigging it up, if you like, at the beginning. And he did that in the first program. And then he seemed to kind of express a bit of dismay about, about well, this is the best we've got so far, but it's not much, is it? He seemed to be saying. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree with you. He, he, had, he expressed that ambiguity in both, in both segments, um, you know, where he, where he, he raises the, 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 um, the welfare reform and seems to suggest that 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 uh, various forms of welfare reform can be effective, and then he he, he lapses into expressing a, a doubt about that. And then I I uh, I was quite surprised at the end where he 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 actually entertained the possibility that maybe we really did need to reshift uh, our focus in favor of vegan education, yeah. and and that we needed and 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 interestingly. He made a comment. He said um, that he agreed that we needed. Uh, he, he he quoted some bit from me, and then he said he agreed that we needed some crystal clear guidelines. And um, and then we talked, and then he then then he, he included the segment about about veganism. And I I was really very surprised because I think in a sense um, the the two segments together uh, really. Um, Presented some 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 shift in, in in Victor's own thinking about this. I mean, I think he 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 may have um, he may have started off thinking that uh, the regulatory reform approach had gotten us somewhere, and uh, I think by the end of it, he was convinced it really hadn't hadn't gotten us, or at least there was a question. He, at least he was raising a serious yeah, I, question. I think, I think that's right. That's 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 how I see it. I, I think I think that. Um, uh, you, you almost got the impression that that um, the the, pro- the program started off 
uh, as one thing, and and it concluded in in a, in, a, in another. I, I talked last time about well, you know, let, let's see this this great animal rights victory and let's analyse it. And he seemed to do that again, uh, as you said. He talked about we we need a crystal uh, crystal clarity of principles. He said. Um, Another thing which, which was a bit ambiguous, right at the end, I thought, Gary, which is quite interesting, because he said that um, the Mavericks have impressed him. Now, obviously, I immediately thought of you in terms of, of the Maverick, but I also wonder whether, whether he meant Balak as well, because in some senses, the analysis would suggest not that, um, as I said, you know, it might be the question that uh, the, the, the Maverick um, knew this, these, these people who might um, inspire a new generation, uh, Mavericks. I, th- I think that was focused on on your material, and it might have well have included Balak initially, initially, but not not the end after the analysis. No, I think I, I think that's right. I mean, I think that that's I think that he, I think that Victor's thinking about this issue. I mean, I I really do think these two segments together present a very subtle, um, much more subtle than you get in major media in in basically you know forty five minutes or whatever the combined total of these two programs was. Um, there was a lot of uh, a lot of stuff going on there, and and as a matter of fact, the the I've listened to both segments several times, and in each in each segment, um, I, I I hear things and and uh, I start uh, I understand something a little bit differently, and I think uh, Schoenfeld is a is, a, is a, a talented and creative guy, and um, and I think he did an interesting uh, I think he did an interesting job uh, with the BBC people putting this together, um, but in any event, uh, uh, Elizabeth, I hope you were, you were happy with the end. I was. Leaping around the room. I was Leap, so, leaping around the room. <laughs> I was leaping around the room. It was just, it was just the best thing that I had ever heard, and I was so excited. And you know, when, when you started out the segment, and you and you and, and he, you know, he acknowledges. I mean, you you make the point right from the beginning before he even gets into vivisection and the analysis of it that as long as people could consume animals like breathing, um, nothing's going to change. And um, and but he said he called them bleak words, and I actually don't think they're bleak words for me. When I learned that fact, when I learned that truth, if you will, they were really empowering words because we do have the the, the ability to change. Because a lot of people feel helpless. You know, these people are eating meat and things like that. And they feel helpless to help animals. You know, they really do. They just don't get. It. So I think those words were very empowering. I think at the end, he he brings it back to that, and he and he ties it together really well. I mean, he started out the segment with you saying that. And and then he ends it with saying, you know, with, with you saying that, um, you know, vegan education um, and, and the, let's, let's examine society's use of animals because that is what's going to make a change. That's what we started out saying. Um, yeah, we, I was myself and I was I was chatting with William at the time and um, we were just, we just were so thrilled. It was really, really for us a really, really a huge thing. I just want you to know that we were, we thought it as an incredible thing. It was wonderful. Well, I, I, uh, I've gotten a lot of uh, really good responses uh, from people who heard that and were very excited that uh, that um, it seems to be moving in a different direction. Gary, I just want to say that as uh, because because like myself, for example, and William Paul, who were really excited about that, you know, we're. The reason we were so excited is because you know we we're we're new vegans, and um, we're just we can still kind of remember you know um, not being vegan and, and the fact that people out there are hearing that who are not vegan and who have never even thought about this that 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 to us just signaled um, a really really positive development with regard to new people who are waking up to the issue with that message. You know, there are people who are going to listen to this BBC documentary who are going to have their interest peaked, who are going to be to to in, you know become interested in the animal issue as we as as people do, and that's the message they're going to start with. Which is why we got so excited because it's probably the first time, do you know what I mean? That that's been allowed to happen as far as really, 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 really mainstream media. Uh, yeah, no. yeah, but I guess that, I guess we're back really to uh, we need to reintroduce that point that you yourself introduced the first Elizabeth the first time, which is the no- notion of subtlety, and Gary just mentioned it uh, previously, and maybe um, it was a little bit too subtle in in a sense because. Um, we we have to we have to speculate really, and we can probably defend this this notion that we're probably listening to this 
um, you know, several times and also very carefully. Whereas, you know, a casual listener is probably going to miss quite a lot of what we've been talking about, um, which is pro pro probably one of the aims of, of this analysis, hopefully for people within uh, the movement, you know, which would, which would be quite good. For example, you know, I think one of the, um, one of the abiding um, um, interpretations that I'll bring from both of it is that he kind of did a bit of a number on the Austrian situation. Um, he, you know, he starts off very positive and then he, he says, well, these are the big victories of this movement in the last 25 years. And then at the end, what have we got? Hardly anything. And then he moves on to, to, to we, we need to go vegan education elsewhere from, from that. So I, I, I think, um, again, it might be a subtle point, but I certainly pick, picked up on that. And I think he did it twice. I think he did it in the first program. And I think he did it in the second one. He was effectively saying, well, you know, we, we're being presented with what's, what's the biggest um, advance this movement is, uh, is, um, is claiming at the moment. And in, in the end, what is it really? And, you know, it doesn't amount to, to much in, in the end. You know, we need, we need another approach. Um, to finish up, there was a, uh, on the website of the European Vegetarian and Animal News Alliance, uh, which I think is pronounced Ivana, uh, there was a uh, uh, posting by Norm Phelps in praise of the new welfareism. And Roger, I think you wanted to make a couple of comments. I've read it as well. Uh, Nor Norm Phelps is somebody who sort of snipes at me about my, my views, doesn't understand them, but nevertheless, that doesn't stop him. And, uh, but, but... In fact, he seems to have a bit of an... A history of sniping at you in the sense that um, it, previously he's talked about one track activism, which he, which is is he, um, he's labelling uh, as the abolitionist approach, and um, you know we also have uh, other pejorative uh, phrases now, as we know, like one plate at a time and this kind of stuff. But um, uh, effectively, it's quite interesting because um, yeah, Phelps is trying to defend uh, new welfareism. Uh, in in a way which contradicts some of the things that that uh, Chantal seemed to conclude on, which is quite interesting. But let's go back to uh, what uh, Phelps says. First of all, he says that he's going to defend the moderate position, but he says, I want to make it clear at the outset that I'm not moderate when it comes to the subject of animal rights. But then he starts talking about treatment. So again, he, he doesn't doesn't seem to uh, have acknowledged this this divide between treatment uh, and uh, Use and um, he then starts to um, quote uh, Peter slogans like um, the rat, the rat is a pig, is a dog, is a boy, and also the the BYD borrowed one with animals in a house. We were experiment on that 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 kind of slogan. Um, but the interesting thing for me is that I'm not quite sure now what new wealth prison really stands for. I think. That uh, when when you started to write about it in 1996, Gary, I think that what people had in mind there was that welfare plus welfare plus welfare will equal abolition. But I'm not actually quite sure now whether they actually want abolition. I, I agree. Uh, look, I, I I agree, and that is something that I discuss in the new book that I have coming out with Robert Garner, the Animal Rights Debate: Abolition versus Regulation. I think the character of new welfareism has changed, and. Phelps makes the statement, which is absolutely empirically wrong, where he says it's a matter of strategy. Everybody wants the same thing. We're just trying to get there in the same t in different ways, and that is so yeah. so incredibly wrong um, that I, I it's hard for me to believe that anybody can maintain that because it is very clear. I mean, I, I agree with you that in 1996. Um, the 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 theme it wasn't ubiquitous by any means, uh, but the theme was that. Uh, we would have welfare reform and welfare reform would eventually lead to abolition. And now that's been... My, but there are some people who clearly don't want abolition. So you have people like Peter Singer who's saying, look, you know, I, I, I think it's entirely possible we could have a situation that's morally fine where we, you know, we eat animal products, we eat flesh from animals that, you know, we have the luxury of meat uh, from animals that have been humanely raised and slaughtered. Uh, and as an act utilitarian, it's hard for me to understand that he could, he really could in certain ways um, uh, oppose animal use altogether. But, but 
certainly the large organizations have sort of fallen behind this uh, this idea now that really we don't want abolition. What we want is uh, we want animals to be treated more humanely and we want at the very most to reduce the number of animals used. Um, you know, we want people to reduce the number of animals and animal products that they're eating. But that seems to be um, the, the goal of a lot of these organizations. Um, I mean, recently, for example, on uh, on on Twitter, HSUS, the HSUS uh, 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 poster said HSUS is not anti-meat, and uh, HSUS has basically said, no, we're not opposed to animal agriculture. Uh, we're not trying to phase it out. Um, and so, so I think that uh, Phelps is wrong to say the end is the same for everybody. The strategy is just different. I think that that's wrong. Um, and and secondly. The thing that is just so remarkable about Phelps and all these people is their mantra-like repetition of we've got to do something to stop animal suffering now and the abolitionists aren't proposing that. Well, that's absolutely wrong um, for a lot of different reasons. But the thing that is most remarkable to me is neither Phelps uh, nor Singer nor any, uh, none of these people ever confront the fact that the empirical evidence is such that animal welfare reform rarely, if ever, does anything other than make animal production more economically efficient. That is all it does. And so it is not economically, it is not moving in any direction, taking animals out of the paradigm of, per, of property and moving them toward the, the paradigm of personhood, as Phelps would suggest. Um, that's absolutely wrong. What animal welfare regulation is doing is further enmeshing animals in the property paradigm by making animal production more efficient. I mean, it is simply wrong. As an empirical matter, it is wrong. Uh, to say that animal welfare reform is doing anything that is moving in the direction of animal personhood. I also think it's empirically wrong to say that it's doing anything to alleviate the suffering of animals now. I mean, Roger, uh, you've made the point before uh, that the animals that are alive now are, you know, they're going to be dead before any of these supposed. That's reforms. right. Yes. In fact, um, this is something that really irritates me about this argument that we get from the new, new welfare. It's this notion that we're doing something right now. And in fact, uh, Phelps tries to kind of um, give a caveat to that in a sense because he because he talks about uh, the animals that are alive now, but also their children and grandchildren. As, as they'll say, okay, well, maybe the ones that are, li are living right now, no, but what about the grandchildren? Even then, in, ta in terms of the timescales, you know, when, when you get a victory, which is not actually a victory because it's not going to be implemented for another 20 years, and by the time it's implemented, it's all changed anyway. In fact, um, he, talk he talks about the European ban on battery um, um, eggs which we've talked about uh, previously. And again, now we've got, we, 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 we've got an interesting thing because the, the general position is that, well, vegan education is difficult, whereas reforming the youth uh, by focusing on treatment is an easier thing to do. We can do it right now. We can help the ones that are living right now or in the near future. I, I just don't, don't see that. In fact, it seems to me that once you start to try and regulate the youth, you're really getting into an incredibly difficult thing to do. Uh, first of all, you know, you've got to spend years and years and years, as uh, Martin Ballag was, was, was talking about, in, in getting the first step done. And, of course, their, their position is that you now then use that as a platform. As though then the first step is set in stone. Whereas, in actual fact, everything just shifts around. And if we go back to the, um, the battery cages, We've got a situation where the goalposts have been, been moved. Um, as, as we've talked about, I came into the movement um, in the late 70s. And at that time, Compassion and Wolf Farm in England already had a battery cage campaign, which is still not coming to fruition until 2012. And yet by that time, the entire goalposts have moved. And what we were looking at was a movement from battery cages to enrich battery cages, which basically means a battery cage with, with a perch and a, and a bit of scratching material. Or, as you said before, we're talking about a cage-free system, which is just one big massive cage now. And so the idea that we're banning anything meaning, meaningful is, um, is rather out of the window. And not only that, you've then got to monitor it all. 
And as we see from all these um, attempts to do that, it's a, it's a very difficult thing to do. Even even some of the richest organizations in the world, like the RSPCA, they admit that they haven't got the funds to monitor the food and food system. And so even though you spend years and years and years bringing, bringing this thing in, you then have to spend years and years and years exposing the fact that it's not been implemented properly, um, just like the, the hunting ban in Britain as well. You know, all, all of these... All of these um, initiatives to regulate the use are presented as, well, this is what we're doing right now because it, it's working and it's going gonna, it's gonna to mean that suffering is reduced. But in actual fact, when you actually start to look at it, it doesn't really mean anything because everything has moved by the time it gets to fruition. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think um, you know, the RSPCA freedom food obscenity is a, uh, a, a large topic in the discussion in the book that Robert and I are doing uh, because um, uh, I think if you look at the literature, uh, the RSPCA literature, it's deeply, deeply disturbing. I mean, it's basically reaching out to industry and saying, let's become partners. We can help you. We can help you sell animals. You can help, uh, you can help us uh, increase humane treatment and blah, blah, blah. And as we know from the exposés that we've already seen, the freedom food, uh, the freedom food situation doesn't work. But you know, um, uh, you know Phelps. Uh, as I said, Phelps really doesn't address any of the arguments that um, uh, about the inefficiencies of 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 of, uh, of uh, or, or the problems with animal welfare regulation and the fact that the, the the very most it does is increase production efficiency. He mentions the 2012 ban on battery cages. Well, you know, as you pointed out, the 2012 ban on battery cages in Europe doesn't require that they get... All it requires is that they substitute these enriched cages, point number one. Point number two, Europe is not going to have enriched cages by 2012. I mean, it is virtually impossible that that's going to. I mean, it, it's it is a logistic matter. It simply cannot happen. 98 percent of the of the egg production in Spain and in many other Western European countries is still the conventional battery cage. So the idea that we're going to have enriched cages by 2012 or anything else by 2012 by like cage-free eggs by 2012 is that's uh, that that we call that um, the, the technical word for that is fantasy. Um, it's simply it's simply not going to happen. <laughs> um, and and you know and 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 he. Pray- Raises things like you know California's Proposition Two. California's Proposition Two doesn't come into effect until 2015, if it ever comes into effect at all. It comes into effect in 2015. The 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 industry is already moving away from uh, gestation crates and veal crates anyway. That's not a that's that's in a state of transition anyway because gestation crates and veal crates are very inefficient. And even if Proposition 2 succeeds in getting rid of the conventional battery cage in favor of the cage-free egg, then what you're going to have is animals that, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like uh, waterboarding somebody on a bare board and waterboarding somebody on a padded board. Animals are still going to be tortured. The difference is that the torture is going to have the stamp of approval of the Humane Society of the United States and all the other organizations that supported it. And what I really find distressing uh, i mean and, and you know phelps is in, in this sense phelps in, in the fact the sense that phelps ignores the empirical economic reality about welfare reform and what it what it does and what it doesn't do phelps is really no different from uh i mean i don't i don't know norm phelps uh, as far as i know i've never met him but uh but uh you know, Singer, for example, ignores this all the time. Bernie Rollin ignore, ignores this all the time. Um, Gary Steiner, who wrote the editorial about veganism in the New York Times, uh, wrote a letter on behalf of him and me inviting uh, Peter Singer and Bernie Rollin to debate the issue of uh, welfare reform, the efficacy of animal welfare reform, and the uh, the the issue about whether or not killing animals per se uh, inflicts a harm on them because that is a position that uh, that, that, that Singer denies for most animals. Uh, he does not believe that they, uh, they have an interest in their lives. Uh, and Singer responded by saying that he would do the debate only if he were paid ten thousand dollars that he uh, he claimed he would then donate to a um, to an organization vegan outreach by the way uh, which uh, which as uh, as many of you know uh, does not uh, claims that uh, claims that consistent veganism is uh, is fanatical like Singer does actually and he wanted to negotiate the topics that we would discuss 
because he didn't uh, he didn't he didn't think they fit together very well and he had some issues. So even if we came up with the ten thousand dollars to pay Peter Singer for a uh, miraculous appearance, um, it was uh, it was going to be we were going to have to discuss what the topics were. Bernie Rollin wrote both to Steiner and to me uh, after after in front of his class. Um, uh, daring me to debate him, and I said, "Fine, I'd be happy to debate you, Bernie." Uh, he then backed down and said that he didn't want to do it because, by doing so, he would uh, offend uh, possibly the meat industry and the other people that he works with because he wouldn't want them thinking that he takes abolition seriously. Well, if Bernie Rollin uh, is so confident that I'm wrong and that he's right, you would think he would jump at the opportunity. To, to pummel me and to expose my position as being, uh, you know, uh, 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 problematic. You would think that Bernie would just jump on the opportunity. But instead what he did is stand in front of his class and make a number of apparently colorful statements about how he wanted to debate me. And then when I accepted, he backed down. And Peter Singer wants $10,000. And Norm Phelps writes these essays which basically ignore the fact that animal welfare reform simply doesn't work. Then he has the audacity. What I, what, what I really love about this is that there's a line in here. I'm looking at it right now. Most people are not like us. And it's in italics. Here we go again. Animal people, those of us who are vegans, we are special. We are holy. We are holy. We are not like the unwashed masses. They are incapable of understanding the message of nonviolence and vegan veganism. Only we, the anointed, the special, those of us who are holy, only, only we can understand the message. This is fundamentally what's involved here. Most of these new welfareists are just elitists. They believe people are stupid. They believe that people have no moral center, no spiritual center, nothing to to appeal to. If I believe that, I'd give it up tomorrow. No, no, no. I'd give it up today. I don't believe that for a second. But uh, in any event, um, well, we're we're now uh, heading heading. This is probably the longest one I've done. Uh, and um, uh, but do you have any? Do you have any? Do you have any uh, final comments you'd like to make? Well, I'll I'll say one thing. Just going back to the the egg thing. Um, well, two things actually. Uh, going back to the egg thing, though. Uh, the breaking oh, news yes. from England or Britain. Is that it? Yes, it seems seems that the British government are doing a U-turn on the entire idea of of abolishing the battery cage in in the first place. So again, it just underlines how difficult it is. Rather than presenting this thing as an easy win, you know, which we can do something for non-humans right now, you know, they should be at least honest in, enough to say, well, we've got this small baby step. The chances are it will be changed by the time it, get, it gets to fruition, if it ever does. And, the ch- you know, the chances are there's going to be some goalposts moving along the way, you know. Um, some honesty in that would impress me more than this claiming of these massive victories all the time, which, which are really playing around with words, really, as far yeah. as I can, I can see. Uh, and then the, the final point, really, for me is... is even if you were to take this view that they do, and you kind of go along with it, if, if you like. Now, my question all the time is, why would it have to be people who regard themselves as animal rights people that have to get involved with welfare? There's always more welfareists in the first place, you know? And so it comes back to the, the notion, you know, I'm forever being bombarded with emails asking me, you know, to sign this petition or do this or go to that, that demo or, you know, are, are you going to listen to this and are you going to take part in that? And and I I kind of think well you know why me you know I'm an animal rights person you know you know why 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 is it divisive that me an animal rights person is not getting involved with welfare which is the claim that they're they're making all the time you know if we don't do what they're doing it's divisive if we just do what we want to do and what we think is the most useful thing to do then we're being divisive I just don't yeah. get that I don't get yeah. that at all. Well, that's part of the that's part of the phenomenon, Roger, of the unfortunately cultish aspect that the movement is um, is 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 moving. The, the movement is moving if in any direction. It's toward cult cultishness, and it's the idea that if you disagree with us, uh, you're being divisive, you're being absolutist, you're being this, you're being that. My view is let them pursue welfare if they want. I think the 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 record speaks for itself. The record of animal welfare is one of abysmal failure. And the point that you made, you made it quickly. I think it's important for people to focus back on it for a second. Uh, I had meant to say something about it before, but as I get older, I forget. 
um, uh, Roger made the point that the British government is now backing off of the abolition of battery cages. Uh, and I believe the Labor government made a statement last week that it was reconsidering um, uh, the abolition of battery cages. And so, um, you know, again, uh, abolition, and I'm using that, you know, in favor of cage-free eggs, which is like not, not, a, not, not, not better in my judgment, but basically they're moving away from the idea that we're going to get rid of battery cages. So, you know, we take these baby steps and the baby steps, you know, never go anywhere. So we have a hunting ban. The hunting ban doesn't amount to anything. We have, you know, all of these welfare reforms, they either never get implemented or if they're implemented, they're not enforced or, you know, whatever. But I mean, the, the history of animal welfare, and I, I, I say this to Peter Singer, Bernie Rowland, Norm Phelps, Wayne Passell, Ingrid Newkirk, anybody else out there, and I'm happy to discuss it with you in, in uh, this forum or any other forum. The history of animal welfare is one of absolutely abysmal failure. The only thing animal welfare campaigns do is to raise money for animal organizations they don't do anything for animals. Indeed, they make people feel more comfortable about animal exploitation. There was an excellent article in Newsweek this week. I posted it on my website about how happy meat is causing people who didn't eat meat to go back to eating meat because they figure, hey, I'm eating it, you know, I'm eating sustainable, sustainably produced meat, humanely produced meat, etc. The history of animal welfare is one of abysmal failure, and I will discuss and debate that with anybody who would like to debate it. And let's get the facts out there and stop reciting the mantra because that's all it is is a it's a mantra of words without meaning and it's this idea that animal welfare reform helps animals now and alleviates suffering and the answer to that is nonsense elizabeth what time is it what time is it in new zealand elizabeth <laughs> um i have no idea but i just want to say that I'm, you know, I'm in New Zealand, and I'm just uh, there, there's this big animal welfare movement here. And the really insidious thing about all this um, is that, you know, you may, you may be very. Tr I think you're right about the the um, the career welfareists um, who really have no interest or have either completely lost hope or have just become so they sold out to the um, the big dollar that they're not interested in abolition. But all of their supporters are so utterly and totally convinced that it is going to lead to abolition because they're being lied to because they're reading this Phelps thing and these words that he used, the billions and billions of animals that we're helping today. I mean, if you read that article, he claims that billions of animals are having incredible amounts of suffering relieved right now and billions are going to be relieved in the future. There's nothing to back up that claim. Um, but the people who are supporting these groups, they are they do want abolition. They're, they're, the followers do are still caught up with this whole that this is all going to lead to abolition. And that's what I that's why I really, really, really think it is so important that, that, that your message got out there on the BBC. So these people, these people who really do want abolition, these new new welfare, if you like, you know, these really kind of they have no clue about the reality of the situation, um, can actually educate themselves because they're being blatantly lied to, they're being told these, like you say, this mantra and this cult like thing, and they really, really believe it. And they be and, and that's such a beautiful thing to say. We're helping billions of animals suffering now and they love to sort of to think that they're doing that and they have no idea about what's really going on. So I want to educate them to hey if you want abolition, then join us, you know, join abolitionist movement on vegan education, you know, and um that because they really do believe these crazy claims and they don't do any research themselves. And I say to them, Have you um actually researched what you're proclaiming? You know, do you actually know for a fact that these forms that you're saying are actually doing anything? And nobody tells them that. And they say, well, gee, I guess not. I guess I trusted my leaders, you know? Yeah, well, that's if this is ever going to change, we've got to get away from that whole model. We've got to become leaders ourselves, each and every one of us. We've got to abandon. I think one of the problems here also is, is the language that we use. I mean, you, talk, you talked about New Labour, Gary. And, um, you know, pe people have been complaining ever since the New, the new Labour Party came into existence. What, what was that? Um, in, into power in 1997 that they backed down on their animal rights claims and their animal rights promises they never made any in the first place you know politicians don't make animal rights pr promises they, they make baby step animal welfare promises because there's no way that a politician you know can promise anything that, that goes anywhere close to animal rights because it's just out of the remit 
you know? Yeah, but they've also but, but but New Labor backed down from the animal welfare stuff that they were promising when they initially came in. I mean, yeah, that's right. But the campaign, the campaigners complain that they backed down from the animal rights things. You know, so they don't even get that bit right as, as well. I mean, it might be true that they backed down from their welfare, which is fair enough. Make that claim, but you know, don't pretend in the first place that it had anything to do with animal rights. Yeah, well, an, animal rights is a very a very. Uh, a very misused expression, to say the to say the very least. But in any event, listen. Um, remember, it's a zero sum game. Every second we spend, every every uh, second of time, every every dollar, pound, or whatever currency you use that we expend on on um, on welfare uh, uh, on welfare reform is fewer resources that we spend on creative nonviolent vegan education. You want to do something to help animal suffering now? Let's change the world. We can do it. The world is vegan if we want it. We we can make it. We and only we, we can make the change. The institutional users aren't going to do it and and the government's not going to do it until the people demand it. So until there is a shift, until there's a paradigm shift, until we all stop looking at animals um, as things to eat, wear, consume, whatever, until we stop seeing the death of 56 billion animals, not including fish, every year for food as something that is as normal as breathing air or drinking water, nothing's going to change people. So if you're not vegan, go vegan. It's incredibly easy. It's better for your health. It is better for the planet. And most importantly, it's the morally right thing to do. I want to thank Dr. Roger Yates and my friend Elizabeth Collins from, from New Zealand, uh, who is doing marvelous, marvelous things there. And, um, and I hear so many wonderful things about you and your work, Elizabeth, uh, from so many people. Uh -huh. And you're really, you're, you're really, you're really hitting that the younger generation, um, in, uh, in a, in a very, uh, very profound way. So keep doing it, kiddo, keep doing it. And thank you, Roger. Uh, as always, it's uh, it's it's wonderful to speak with you and to get your perspective. And I hope that we will do this uh, this sort of uh, you know conversation again in the future. Thank you all for listening and go vegan. Bye. <laughs>